could I have picked a more boring video topic? Debatable. Today we're going to talk about how to set up a documentation website. I am on the edge of my seat. Now jokes aside, this is actually going to be a good experience because you guys are with me and I'm not going to put you through a bad experience. The thing is writing documentation and putting it up onto a web server does not have to be tedious. Documentation is everywhere. There should be some documentation about how to get my bloody hair and all. Documentation is everywhere. I think that having a good solution for documentation, being able to write good documentation for whatever it is that you're working on, and in fact, even if you just need to get some, some information onto a website, we can take it and turn it into an elegant process. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Now, I'm making a game engine called Hazel, as most of you know. We're only now beginning to kind of get people to actually use this engine to make games, and so it's becoming more and more important to actually make documentation, to write documentation for the engine. So I I set up this website, docs.hazelengine.com. Now it's not anything fancy because it really just needs to do its job well and that is to provide people with documentation, with information. However, I took it upon myself to try and make this as nice of a process as possible, to make it as easy as possible for anyone working on Hazel to add to the documentation or change it, and also make it flexible enough where we could kind of include anything we wanted. So today, right here, I'm actually going to take you through how to create something like docs.hazelengine.com from scratch, like literally from purchasing a server, signing up for a hosting plan, all the way through to actually having this website. And even though documentation is like the specific example we're going to be looking at today, this like whole process can actually be used to set up any website. If you just want a website that you can easily update and it's kind of pain free and you don't even have to log into a web server or anything, you can definitely do that here. So what on earth am I talking about and how does this even work? Well, it's very simple. Basically this entire website is just made out of Markdown files. What we do is we write whatever content we want in Markdown and then all we have to do is commit and push our changes. So whether that be adding pages, modifying pages, doing anything really. And then once we've pushed that to Git, our website is just magically updated. That's it. That's all there is. And look, you can even like search for stuff by just hitting the S key. Magic. So let's take a quick overview of how all of this works. So first of all, why Markdown? Markdown is a markup language, I guess. It's honestly becoming like one of my favorite word processes, if you could even call it that. Just because it's so easy when you're writing something to just, I guess, mark up your words, or should I say mark down your words, and be able to easily control how they appear. I remember using this back in university to output PDF files as well, instead of using something like Microsoft Word. You know, as an engineer, it's just faster for me to open up VS Code and just write something. I'm sure I don't need to sell most of you guys on the idea of Markdown. It's great. And of course, a huge benefit is that it is just text. So, you know, you don't need to worry about what is this proprietary file format or anything like that. Everything is right there in the Markdown. We just need something to be able to render it. Now, there is a lot of stuff out there that can take your Markdown files and convert it into like PDF or HTML files. If you want to just write an entire book in Markdown, you can just convert it to a PDF file, print it, and it's going to look beautiful. But for a website, we really just want HTML files. We want to write our stuff in the Markdown format and then just have something to convert it to HTML. Should be pretty simple because Markdown is quite simple itself and you can actually write a lot of HTML code within Markdown if you want to. There's actually plenty of stuff that does that for you as well. And I've actually trialed a bunch of it. But my favorite by far is something called MD Book. This little app, which is written in Rust, by the way, yeah, that got your attention, simply takes a bunch of your markdown files and makes like a book out of it. And that book could be like a site, but it could also be like a PDF document. <laughs> So the plan is quite simple. All you have to do is basically list out the markdown files that you want included as part of your site. You can organize them like however you want really. And then you just tell it to build. And then what it does is it takes all that stuff and outputs HTML files along with like a whole bunch of boilerplate JavaScript and CSS and all that stuff to actually make the website work. It does that super quickly and it produces a website that looks great on like all devices. Okay, cool. So we have something that can generate HTML files from our markdown. We just need a server to be able to host those HTML files and like, you know, serve them. That's what servers do. But then we still have the problem of having to update those markdown files somehow on the server. That can get annoying and that's that sounds a bit tedious. And once those markdown files have been updated, we need to rebuild the website. So how do we make that easier? That's where the whole Git repository thing comes in. What we can do is actually set up a Git repository using GitHub, using GitLab, whatever really. Store our entire collection of markdown files there along with any empty book like metadata. Create a webhook that notifies our server whenever a new commit is pushed to that repository. So then the server can pull the latest changes 
and just build the book again. Beautiful. That means that you can add as many collaborators as you'd like into that Git repository. And whenever they push, the site gets updated. So how do we set this up? Well, step one, we need a server. And for that, we're going to be using Hostinger, the sponsor of today's video. For those of you who watch my other videos, you know that I love hosting and I have a great partnership with them. They're honestly my favorite web host out of all the ones that I've tried and they're extremely affordable and super high quality. I'll leave a link in the description below where you can sign up. For this particular video, I'm going to be using one of their VPS servers. We need a VPS server so that we have full root access so that we actually have full control over our server. We can set it up however we like. If you are signing up for a new plan using my link in the description below, don't forget to use the coupon code CHERNO to get an extra discount. And if you're using any other web host, you're dead to me. That's totally fine. Most of this video will be the same. Now, once you've got yourself a shiny new server using Hostinger, you'll see it over here ready for setup. The setup itself is pretty simple. You just give your server a name, a location, a root password, and you choose an operating system. I'm just gonna go with the latest version of Ubuntu. It'll take a few minutes for the VPS to be built. And you can see we have all of the details here. Now, if I just browse to the IP address of the VPS, you can see that Apache 2 has already been installed and we see this page. I'm not gonna bother setting up a domain or anything like that for this example, just gonna use the IP address. So let's go ahead and SSH in. Now, I like using Windows Terminal, which is this new thing that they've released. You can get it on the Windows Store. It's pretty nice. Let's SSH into our server. And you can see that obviously with a VPS, we have full control over just the root of everything. Now, as a quick little side note for Hazel's documentation, server, I actually used Nginx instead of Apache. Hosting it has plenty of nice documentation on how to set it up, as does DigitalOcean. This is basically the guide that I followed to set that up. However, for this example, since Apache 2 is already installed and actually works really nicely with PHP out of the box, we're just going to stick with Apache. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and open up our site configuration file using Vim, of course. And we'll just set our document root, that is where the website exists on our drive, to be inside com.documentationwebsite slash public. This is just like a convention I use for my websites. Now to make that take effect, we have to restart Apache. If this was a real setup, I would probably make my own configuration file rather than editing the default one as I did, but this is totally fine. Let's make this document root directory that I just added to that Apache configuration file, and we'll just add an index.html file that simply says hello. Now let's refresh our web page and look at that we're web developing. Now, since we'll be using PHP for our webhooks, we need to make sure the PHP is installed and working correctly. Let's write some PHP code and make sure that our server can execute it. And there we go, lol. Let's install PHP. Once that's done and we've restarted Apache, much better result. Now as a quick little sanity check to make sure everything is working correctly with PHP, we can just run this PHP info function. And if we go back to our web page, you can see that it displays all of the information we want, such as the configuration file location and the settings we've got enabled. And now we can finally begin with our documentation website. So we're going to be obtaining MD book, I'll leave a link to this in the description below. If you actually go to the releases, they have pre-built binaries for like all platforms. So we're gonna take this Linux one, obviously, copy that link address. And then to make things easier, we're gonna to go to our bin directory at the root of our server and just download that file there and then unzip it, untar it. Now, because we placed it into that bin directory, which is part of our path, we should be able to switch back to our website directory and simply run mdbook. And as you can see, everything works. If this is your first time using mdbook, I highly recommend you check out their documentation, which it itself is actually using mdbook, of course. They've got a fantastic, easy to read, simple guide on how to actually get up and running with this. So we're gonna call mdbook init at the current directory. It'll ask us some questions and generate a whole bunch of files. mdbook build is the only thing we have to run to actually build the site from the raw markdown files. And once we've done that, if we navigate to the book directory using our browser, you can see our built site up and running. Now, I don't really wanna have to go slash book, in the browser, of course, the root of the website should be that book directory. So if we go back to our site configuration file, we can just update the document root and restart Apache. Now, as you can see, we can get rid of that slash book and we wind up in the same place. Now, I'm not gonna give a complete tour of MD book here. This book.toml file has the main kind of configuration for this book. Remember what we're building here really is a book, not a site. It can be accessed as a site, but you can also like export it to a PDF. It's great we're making a book. Now this summary file inside the source directory is very important. This lists not only like the sidebar navigation links to every single page, but this is the index of every page you want included in your book. It will not be built if it's not in here. So make sure that every markdown file you want to be part of your book is listed here. Let's go ahead and add this homepage 
page as an example. We're listed in the summary file along with its path, and then we can just simply make the file and this is just your regular markdown. Let's add some example text. We'll run MD book build to actually build the site and then just simply refresh it. It's that easy. Now it's uh, hurting my eyes a little bit here, but luckily MD book comes right out of the box with a bunch of themes. You can of course make your own. We won't get into that in this video, but the included themes are great as well. And that's basically it. That should be enough to get you started. It is just markdown. So let's go to hazelengine.com as an example, copy that image, add it as a link. You get the point, super easy. If you need to make subdirectories, because of course your website will presumably grow, especially if it's documentation, just make more directories, make more pages, more markdown files, and then just add them to that summary. It's also super easy to make links between pages. So here you can see I'm linking back to the home page. From the home page, I'm linking to that additional page I just made. All you're doing here is creating like a markdown link to the markdown file, not to the future HTML file or anything like that, specifically to the markdown file. After adding our new page to the summary file and building, you can see the fruits of our labor. And that's it for the basic setup. Like you're, you're ready to go, you're, you've got a website. Now let's take a look at how we can actually set up some webhooks using GitHub to automate this. As a side note, docs.hazelengine.com is actually using GitLab. So the process was a little different for like when I set it up. But in this video, I thought I'd use GitHub since that seems to be more popular. The process is like 90% the same. We'll make a new repository on GitHub. I'll just call it documentation website. To be honest, I'm not sure if this level of detail is really that necessary for this video, but there's something satisfying about showing the entire process process, you know? Let me know what you think in the comment section below. Let's install git on our server and clone the repository. I'm just going to steal that .git directory, move it into the current directory. So our current kind of book directory becomes the git repository directory. And then we can just commit and push everything. Now, uh, GitHub specifically has these authentication tokens that you need to set up. You can't simply use your username and password like you can with GitLab. So we've got to set that up as well. Finally, we've pushed our data. Now let's set up that webhook. Super easy to set up. We just go into the settings for our repository, webhooks, add webhook. And then we need to provide a payload URL. This is the URL that GitHub will basically send a bunch of data to whenever there is some kind of event. So for us, that's just going to be a push event. It's going to send some data into that URL and we'll just write some code to receive that data and do something. Now there is one little caveat with our setup. The root of our web site actually points specifically to that built book directory that is regenerated every time we build using MD book. So what I'm doing here is creating an alias so that if the URL contains slash hook, it actually points to a different directory where we can have a PHP file that will receive that data from GitHub and actually do something. Now let's create that directory, make an index.html file to test it out and make sure that that alias is set up correctly. As you can see, it works. Now let's rename the file to update docs.php. That's going to be where our payload gets sent from GitHub. I'll paste that URL into GitHub and we'll change the content type to be JSON. In case you are doing something a bit more sophisticated, JSON will just be easy for PHP to parse and retrieve any metadata that you might need, but this will set you up for something deeper. Now you can see that GitHub actually sent like an initial ping with a bunch of data here in the payload. I thought this would be a good reference to refer to as to what we can expect in terms of data, but I was wrong as you'll see later. Read the documentation. Like this video is literally about creating documentation, but like you also have to read documentation. That's important. Anyway, let's move on and write some PHP code that will actually receive that data. We'll just grab all of it and put it into JSON decode, which will let us access the data in an object oriented way. I'll also write this little log message utility function so that we can log what's going on to a file since GitHub will be the one executing this script. And I wanna see what's going on. Now, if we run that script ourselves by just refreshing our web browser, going to that URL, you can see we don't have a log file. So what's going on? Let's make sure we're actually logging something. But no, still no log file. So maybe there's like an error or something. Let's go back and call PHP info so that we can find out where our PHP configuration file is located. And then we can edit it and set display errors to on so that that script will actually give us a response as to what's happened. And now if we run it again, you can see we have a warning, fail to open stream permission denied. That's because we made that directory as root, of course, but our web server is not running as root and it definitely should not. So what we need to do is change the owner of this directory to w www data because as you can see that's what's actually running our web server and then we'll have permission to make files. Now permissions are a hot topic in the realm of web development and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in that so let's just move on. Log is working. However, we have this weird like new line not actually being escaped and uses a new line. I don't know why I put single quotes didn't work so let's change it to double quotes and magically it works. Great. PHP. Now, since we're meant to be logging that payload, let's re-deliver the message from GitHub since it actually contains JSON data. But you can see nothing got printed. 
Let's go back to our PHP file. Actually, before we do that, GitHub has this useful response tab which contains the body, so I like the response of that PHP file. And because we're displaying errors and all that, we can actually see a stack trace. It's not printing anything because we're accidentally trying to log that JSON object instead of a string. So let's just change it to input and re-deliver that GitHub payload. Excellent, that's all of our data. Now let's do something useful with it. Referring to the example payload, back in our PHP file, let's access that events array and check to see whether it contains a push event. If it does, we'll just log something. And again, if we re-deliver that payload, you can see that it works. Now, a quick little note. We don't actually have to do any of this for our scenario because every event is a push event. But again, I'm just showing you a deeper example. Now let's finally write some real code. So what do we actually want to happen when we receive a push event? Well, let's log something just for diagnostics. And then I wanna execute a bunch of commands. First of all, let's change directory into the root directory of our repository of our book. And then let's do a git pull to receive that latest push. And then we'll just call mdbook build to build our book. Now I'm using the shell exec function and storing the result in that result variable so that I can actually see the output. To make sure that we get that error stream also going into that result variable, we have to do this to right angular bracket ampersand one. I did a dollar sign one in the git pull, so that's why it's not gonna work here. But after I fix it, you can see that we get that error output from git going right into our log file so we can see what's going on. Now again, we get a permissions error because of course the .git directory was also created by root and we're trying to execute it through www data. And by execute, of course, the PHP script is a thing being executed, but it's trying to write to that .git directory because that's just part of a git pull. So let's just go ahead and make that entire public directory be owned by www data. That's kind of my purpose for creating a public directory that's owned by like the web server. And now you can see we successfully git pull and build our book. Brilliant. So that's basically up and running now. All that remains is testing it. So I'm gonna clone this repository on my actual computer and then open it up in VS Code. This is usually what I use to write Markdown. They have this brilliant preview window, as you can see, that will preview your entire Markdown, including like images and stuff like that. Links will even work. Let's add some random text just to test it out and push. I'm just gonna set up these windows side by side here so we can see both the log output of our server as we actually push that commit. So we've pushed and nothing, c'est la vie. I'm gonna spare you guys the details here and show you this very sped up footage of me <laughs> diagnosing and fixing this problem. So the problem was GitHub somewhat lied, well, deceived me as far as what would be included in the JSON payload. If you actually look at their documentation, you can see there is no events array, there is no hook section. If you have just a push event, it sends you this. So with that in mind, let's go back to our PHP script and get rid of some of this code that tries to look for that events array and the push event. I mean, if we're only sending push events, then as long as the JSON input isn't null, we can assume it probably came from GitHub. No one else should really be sending us any payload. But either way, if the JSON was parsed successfully, let's just go ahead and execute our script to pull and build. Third time lucky, and here's the push. Beautiful. There's that git pull being executed successfully and our book being built. And if we refresh our page, of course, it has been updated. So yeah, that's pretty much it. It's working perfectly. Let's try one more time. Let's make an entirely new page here. I'll actually just write a little C++ hello world example. Don't forget to go into the summary file and add your new page. And that's it. If we just do another git commit and push, our server should receive everything. And you can see that our website has been updated with that new page. Amazing. And that's it. That was probably the most fun part of your entire documentation experience because now you actually have to write the documentation. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that it was helpful. If you did enjoy it, please don't forget to hit the like button below. Why is this pillow falling? This channel is mostly about C++ and game engines. So it's a little weird to have some web dev stuff here, but the truth is like web is everywhere. Like it's inevitable to make it through a development career without really interfacing with web servers. So I thought I'd kind of take you guys through what I had to do for, for Hazel. Let me know what you thought in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out hosting using my link in the description below with that coupon code channel and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.